So good morning. It is still morning in Montana. We have shortly 12 minutes before it becomes afternoon. I'm Elsie Arntzen, the state superintendent, and I'm very, very pleased that we have an audience today, and this is also being recorded for future. What's exciting about this is we're discussing an opportunity. We're discussing an adventure of the last four years, but we are also discussing an investment in our children in Montana. We have a great panel that is going to be moderated today by Miss Wendy Fonz. And what's exciting about this is she's building relationships with over 400 of our school district's leaders across our state. And again, I'm gonna come back to the word, the investment of the federal dollars so that Montana has a better pathway forward. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lane. Uh, Dr. Lane is from the Department of Education and I appreciate our relationship with the department. So Dr. Lane. Thank you, Superintendent. It's great to be with all of you. Uh, good morning to Montana. It's afternoon here in DC, but uh, I'm excited to, to be with you. My name again is James Lane. I'm a senior advisor in the office of the secretary, but I've also been delegated the assistant secretary responsibilities for the office of elementary and secondary education. And I manage uh, the American Rescue Plan, uh, which is uh, one of the, well, at least the ESSER funds, which is one of the programs I, I hope to talk to you about today. The American Rescue Plan uh, was passed in March of 2021 to ensure that our schools would open as fast as possible, but also that our students would recover coming out of the pandemic. Since day one, this administration and our department have acted with urgency about pandemic recovery. We worked diligently to get ARP funds out the door quickly and we did it. And the ARP had impact immediately. When the American Rescue Plan was passed just after our administration came into office, only 47% of our schools were open in the nation. By November of that same year, just months later, following the signing of this historic investment, nearly every school in America had opened. And as, as important as these funds were for reopening schools though, we must keep in mind that these funds were also needed and especially needed for student academic recovery. The recent release of the nation's report card further underscores the need for us to invest in student academic recovery. And because academic recovery requires investing more and investing wisely, we've paired these funds with technical advice, guidance and resources to help schools invest in what works when it comes to academic recovery. We're working every day to ensure that these funds are spent wisely and effectively and show that the additional resources will make a difference now and in the long run for our students. As part of the department's efforts to support strong implementation of the American Rescue Plan, we're continuing to bright spot and lift up strong examples of districts and states leveraging these funds to help students recover. We use our best practices clearing wet, clearinghouse website where we spotlight districts and states devoting robust levels of ARP funds to catch students up academically and to meet their uh, mental health needs. 
We have prioritized this clearinghouse because we know that states learn best from each other and districts learn best from other districts. In the clearinghouse, we've seen states go big on high dosage tutoring. We've seen states leveraging these funds to hire more mental health professionals or lower the, uh, the number of school psychologists and school counselor ratios. And we've seen states and districts reimagine the systems that prepare and support a high quality teacher workforce, while all the while expanding after school and summer programming. Montana is leveraging these funds in important and unique ways. The, the Montana Department has announced funding in the state's after school grant program to support young learners and provide quality programs to students across the state. And in Billings, they've announced a program that would use federal relief funds to support uh, their a mental health program, which helps uh, students and their families find access to resources necessary to help students recover from their, their mental health. We've also seen ARP funds help districts across the country build innovative and creative learning models to spur, to spur transformational learning opportunities for students and to better align systems to enable flexibility in the school day to better prepare students to meet the demands of an ever-changing workforce and our economy. We have an extraordinary opportunity to reimagine our systems of teaching and learning to better align with our students' needs. We know that we can vastly improve access to high-quality learning, but we know that this won't happen on its own and it must happen in partnership with parents. It takes more than just refining strategies or tinkering with programs or repurposing some funds to truly improve teaching and learning. We must think strategically. It will mean more intentional program, data-driven decision-making and the marshalling of resources towards promising programs and practice that truly moves the needle. It will mean rethinking what's possible and embracing the urgency of now. Right now, thanks to the historic investment of the American Rescue Plan, states and districts have the resources available to maximize student potential and, and truly make it a reality. Now, while these programs are critical uh, for providing funding and support to the field, we know there is much more work to do. So I wanna go back to the NAEP results I mentioned previously. And look no further than the results and following the re release, Secretary Cardona from the US Department of Education convened a summit at the department's headquarters to confront these data head on, to speak clearly about the challenges they present, but also to note the resilience that our system of public education has demonstrated over the past two years. At the kickoff event to this series, Secretary Cardona challenged us across the country to not just re refine old strategies or put band-aids on big problems. Instead, he said our charge is to address the fundamental challenges that have plagued our system and were highlighted in the nation's report card. He issued a clear call that we need to raise the bar for America's public schools, a call to increase expectations for student learning, a call to lift up educators and elevate the teaching profession, a call to improve the adequacy of school funding systems, and a call to use the, the resources to expand and implement the programs we know matter for students' academic outcomes and their mental health and well-being. The series has focused on policies, practices, and programs that can boost math and literacy outcomes. We've brought together world-class researchers who study math and literacy instruction and who surfaced what we know now works. These sessions not only help practitioners tuning in, but also policymakers who know we need to do more to improve the rigor of math and literacy instruction. This series is a push to policymakers, education leaders, and our, our communities to move beyond investing in things but to invest in transformational change that really makes a difference in our students' academic outcomes. To do this, we'll need to redouble our efforts to boost teaching and learning while also innovating the school experience so that students have more authentic experiences. We need to keep our foot on the gas on academic recovery. We have to ensure our schools are places that foster a strong teaching profession, one that young people want to join and stay in for years to come. That means making sure that we bolster mental health supports so that our students have what they need. We know states and districts are laser focused on helping students catch up academically while also meeting their other needs. We know the American Rescue Plan funds are making a lot of this work possible. With just under two years left to expend the funds on time, it is important that districts look at their student academic performance data and use these data as an opportunity to go back to their previously approved ARP spending plans to ensure that they have maximized the resources needed to support their students. I heard from a researcher recently that many students needing tutoring were receiving around 30 hours a year of additional support, but that high dosage tutoring may need to expand to as much as 100 hours per year to truly catch students up at the pace that we want. Further, we know that expanding kindergarten readiness programs, summer learning opportunities, 
and after school academic programs can have an impact as well. So let's take this moment that the data from NAEP has made so clear, ensure that the American Rescue Plan is invested in a way that will improve the future of our students and their education. And we know that states and districts have strong discretion on how these funds are spent and prioritized. So we're seeing states and districts assessing the community needs, working and engaging with parents to ensure those needs are met. So again, from the Department of Education, I wanna thank you for having us here to talk about the investment that the American Rescue Plan has, has brought to our school communities. Montana has wonderful educators and amazing educational leaders. And we look forward to learning more about how these resources are being put to use to make a difference in the lives of your states and our nation's children. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Dr. Lane. We really appreciate you being able to be here and to give the overview from the United States federal perspective and also how it intertwines and works so well with our state itself. And to transition now, my name is Wendy Fonz and I'm the ESSER EANS Director. And we have a wonderful panel that's on with us today that will be discussing how the funds are actually used in their own individual districts and sharing out the stories from their perspective of the use of the funds, both in the past and also going forward. Our panel today consists of school districts and also the public in terms of After School Alliance has been uh, gracious enough to join us today to talk about how non-public school entities are also using those funds to help bridge and support all students across Montana. Our panel today consists of Stefan Schreiber, who is the superintendent of Glendive. And then we also have uh, superintendent Joel Graves of Eureka. We have uh, Rachel Wandershed of After School Alliance. And we have Karen uh, Davis Smith, uh, sorry, Heather Davis Smith, of um, Target Range outside of Missoula. And then lastly, we have a superintendent of a county who manages a lot of the rural schools, and that is Rhonda Long. So we're gonna go ahead and start with the superintendent from Glendive, Stefan Schreibeis. Thanks, Wendy. Um, very honored to be here with all of you. Um, you know, when I was asked to share on um, our story, you know, we. We have many different things happening here in Glendive that we've used these funds and have plans to use the rest of the funds. But the, the story that I'm gonna to talk to you about is um, um, called our JES Water Health Project. And that's what I'm gonna be doing. But um, for those of you, uh, my name is Stefan Schreibeis. I'm the superintendent in Glendive. And, um, and we, we love our community and um, love our students and staff. And I think that's really what the story is, is how do we, use these funds in a way to do everything that uh, we were, that was just described about trying to keep schools open. How do we recover? And then how do we invest in that academic recovery? And so my project might look a little bit different because this was not a project that we were planning on doing. Um, basically what happened in December of 2021, we had to, we finalized our lead testing and we saw that our, our water was corrosive. And so we had to do a lot of things to mitigate that. And one of the things that were was going to happen was we were going to relook at it in the summer. Um, DEQ had us um, do that. And we ended up having a pipe break in June, which when we were going to look at it again. And um, when we re-looked at it, we saw it was a little bit more corrosive than what we thought. And so the state shut one of our buildings down. And we were no longer going to be able to use it and use the water that was coming out. It's on a well. And um, this made it difficult for us, obviously, to, you know, when we've already had such a learning loss and Glendive got hit pretty hard on this, our, our learning loss was, um, you know, the virtual aspect of it right away, but then we went to a hybrid um, way to reopen schools, and so kids weren't um, at school as much as they could, and so to have another time to where they aren't going to be at school, we didn't have another place to put them, so they would be virtual, so we had to really get going on a project to try to help uh, mitigate this and not only make it safe for students and staff to come back to school, but also once they're back at school to help mitigate um, the spread of uh, COVID and all the other illnesses that um, go around our schools. And so that became a, a really difficult thing to do, uh, especially in our situation and not to, you know, take too much time. We, we came up with a plan that everyone uh, 
became on board with, uh, which is basically uh, getting cisterns and we, we actually haul water from Glendive to West Glendive. And that's a whole story in itself as to why that would be. But, um, and then we pump that into the school. And so that is the current plan. We have it up and running. And, you know, thanks to the ESSER money to be able to help mitigate the spread and to continue to not have learning loss um, continuing in our, our, our buildings by going virtual. We were able to do this along with building reserve funds as well. And um, we have this up and running. We have plans for um, us to do more testing here at the end of this, this year. We're still hauling water um, in for drinking, um, but we but the state has allowed us to have school operate um, with washing hands and stuff because it has been deemed safe enough for that. But we are hopefully at the end of this year going to be testing again, and we're hoping that um, it's going to be good for pretty much everything in our building. Uh, if not, then we are going to be going into a different phase where we are going to be having to change out pipes and stuff. But, um, but it's amazing how something as simple as water affects a school and affects learning. And that's something that we have realized and how, you know, just even cleaning surfaces or washing hands, um, something that's very important, uh, especially in today's day and age that, you know, we need to take care of and not having that was something that was really difficult. And so to be able to do this, um, we've been, you know, really um, blessed to be able to have this money to be able to do that, but then also to use the money for a lot of other things that we're excited about too, to kind of help with the learning loss, but then also um, to really start moving um, back to uh, that academic recovery. So that's that's our story here in Glendive that I wanted to share. Hopefully I didn't go over my time, but I appreciate all of you for being here and, and listening. Thank you so much, Superintendent Strybus. Uh, one of the things that um, we've all been challenged with, and I think you really demonstrated well, was the fact that um, these ESSER funds are flexible and that because they were emergency release funds, there was the anticipation that funding could be used a particular way. Districts sat down and, and made a budget and determined that, but then life happens. And the importance of getting those students back in that building has really demonstrated across our state to be very important. And so the flexibility of the funds to be able to change midstream the use of funds that way and therefore impact the students in a different way, but equally important, if not more. Um, you really took the bull by the horns, as it will, and, uh, and really made that happen. So we appreciate you sharing today what you did, because I know it's been, it's been a challenge, I'm sure. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. So our next um, guest speaker up is um, Superintendent Joel Graves, and he's from Eureka. So Joel. Hi there, and thank you, Wendy. Um, and I guess I want to first uh, just throw out, I'm a first year superintendent, so I kind of got pitched into this ESSER thing from the beginning, and this causes me to want to give a couple of shout outs, and one is to Wendy herself, who has been huge in helping me navigate this uh, system. And the other is my district clerk, Ana Escobar, who um, without her expertise, um, I can tell you this would be a challenge. And just working with the two of them has made life a lot easier for me. And I'm learning a lot of things as I go. But I inherited a plan. and But as um, Wendy just mentioned, life happens and things change and you develop. And one of the things that um, I felt like two big things that were missing in Eureka. One is our mental health. You know, kids were struggling from that. Um, being out, being gone, just not being served, not seeing the school every day. And then also the certain population of kids that don't have a connection to the school or don't have that need to be here. And so um, we developed a, a class. It's called Tiny House Class, where kids are actually building tiny houses. Um, and it's it does a double thing. It's it's to help them develop the skills to go out into the workforce when they graduate so that a local contractor can say, you know what, this kid could go to work. Um, but also we have a terrible housing shortage here in Eureka. It's extremely expensive to get housing here, especially for a teacher. And so we're kind of hoping to kill two birds, so to speak, um, by developing some young builders and also creating some um, somewhat affordable housing. Um, and so how does that play into ESSER funds? Well, a couple ways. One, um, first of all, we had to lease some space off-site because we don't have a facility on our campus big enough to build um, tiny houses. And there just happened to be a contractor that built a couple of these new facilities that we could do that in, and so we're working on um, an amendment to lease space with ESSER funds. And then also, 
um, we're purchasing a, a uh, 15 passenger van to haul those kids back and forth to the site because it's about five miles from the school. Um, it's not very affordable to drive a school bus every day and hire a bus driver when I can have my teacher tr transport them out there in a van. And then also that van can be used for other things within the school when you're hauling a group of speech and drama kids or something, the group that we have typically are a little smaller, um, save us some money in those capacities. And so this group of kids that have taken this class, these were, my, a lot of these were my kids that were fringe dropout kids. They were not doing well through the pandemic. They did not do well online. Didn't really see a, a need to come back to school. But when we got this class started and we, you know, we reached out to these kids. And um, so we have 15 kids in there now that are taking this class. And these are kids that they spend half of their day doing the tiny house. And it's much easier to come back to campus and do their core academic classes for the other half of the day when they know they've got this other this other project they're going to and the just the pride that they've developed in in seeing this you know, you know develop they're they're actually building a house and they're seeing it happen in front of their eyes and of course they're getting a lot of attention for this because there's a lot of people that want to come see this we've had a, numerous people want to come purchase them and so they they come look at them and you know it's it's been really great for these kids because they've developed that sense of pride in what they're doing and their attendance has been amazing we have not these kids are not missing school because they they kind of know they need to be there to work on it. And um, so that's that's been amazing. And the other part of the mental health, we did have to hire a couple of counseling assistants. We have one high school counselor. We have one elementary counselor, you know, and we have 800 kids in our district. So we had to get um, a little help there. We used semester funds for that. And then also this next week, um, I think it's on the 9th and 10th of January, we're bringing in Rachel's Challenge. I don't know if you're familiar with Rachel's Challenge, but it's definitely worth looking up. It's a great program, and this is something we're using Nestor Funds for. And actually, our whole community is excited about this. And there's there's a section for the for the middle school, for the high school, and then for the community. And um, I believe it will be well attended by the community as well, just because it's been so important. And I feel like they see a need for this. So um, that's kind of where you know these are just a couple of things. I know there's other other uses that we're using, but these are a few things that I've amended our funds to um, help facilitate. And again, I just want to thank Wendy and, and Anna because the, the help I've received has been um, amazing and that's how we've accomplished it. So if anybody has any questions for me, you know, I would, I'm always available. You can reach me on my school email because I am going to have to check out when I'm done here. I have to take somebody to a doctor's appointment. And so I wanted to, if there's anything before I check out, um, fire away. Otherwise, I'm going to log off and just thank you for having me. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this. Thank you so much, Superintendent Graves. Again, it's really nice to hear how you have braided those funds together and not just taken the funds for one activity, but recognize the gain for other activities within the school. And as you've already heard me say, I'm in line for one of those teeny houses. So appreciate the work that you're doing on so many fronts. And again, the, the students gaining the math skills, the communication skills, all feed into the academics that then they go back into the classroom to learn that way as well. So again, thank you so much. I know you did indicate you have to head out and I do appreciate you being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. So our next guest speaker is transitioning a little bit into the after school format. It is um, Rachel Wanderscheid, and she's going to talk today from the perspective of being the director for the After School Alliance. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here on the, and uh, taking your time out of your day to listen to all of us. Um, again, my name is Rachel Wanderscheid, and I'm the director of the Montana After School Alliance. Montana After School Alliance is a statewide organization. We work with any and all of the out of school time programs across the state um, in all of our different communities. We hope that there is a program and if there's not, we try to encourage uh, programs to develop. And um, we as an intermediary organization uh, serve to be the voice of those programs to our elected, appointed, and employed leaders around the state. Um, we also, in turn, kind of take the information that is, you know, funding availability or, or program opportunities or training, and we bring those back to the programs to try and make sure that we're getting the highest quality programming and staff de development around the state. 
for uh, the programs that are taking care of our kids uh, when the school day or the school year ends. And so out of school programs um, are, are quite a variety. Um, they're different in each of our communities, but they're important to our kids no matter where they are. Um, and we do need more. In most communities, they're sort of, um, you know, people who care a lot, try to get a lot done with very little funding. Um, but what happens to our kids at the end of the school day? Where do they go? Especially if they're five, six, seven, they're, they're too old for daycare, but they're not old enough to be just running around. And so when our, our communities have a safe after school program for these kids, that's, it, it improves everybody's um, health and well being. And it allows our parents to go back to work. Um, and we did see during the pandemic, the importance of these out of school programs to our communities and um, the importance for our kids to still keep these connections with their peers. Um, and then in turn, as, as we've been kind of transitioning back to a new normal and trying to get back to, um, you know, programming as normal, our kids have had a lot of recovery to do. And these after school and summer programs have been really key for that, that recovery. Um, and I think a lot of folks, you know, the, the funding for programs has been, um, and for schools has has come out in you know different installments with a lot of you know, trying to get it done as quickly as possible and in the best way possible um, and so it's caused a lot of um, you know excitement for programs to have the opportunity to have this funding but I think also challenges in terms of how do you make this funding go as as long as possible and serve as many kids as possible and are we getting you know changes from our federal government asking us what we need that is directed to OPI and then from OPI to the programs and so I think a lot of programs have kind of just been trying to pivot with that we've seen a lot of that the um, MTAA itself does not um get any of this grant funding nor do we um you know disperse any of it we have just tried to be a resource for the programs to make sure they're getting the information about when it's when it's open when they can reapply when what the requirements are for those um applications and we've really just seen some some really cool programs come out of it and some programs kind of be able to take their their summer learning to a new level, for example, or, or programs being able to fix equipment that they um, have, you know, been cobbling together for many years now. And what MTAA right now is focusing on is trying to get um, our school districts and our local programs to work in partnership um, with this funding. But part of that is because um, the bill itself requires that 20% of the funds go to um, evidence-based interventions that include summer learning, summer enrichment, extended day, comprehensive after school, and extended year programs. And in a lot of school districts, we're seeing that, that, that you know, this, there's this set aside, we're not sure what to do with it we may just start a, a tutor program at the end of the day that meets that. But what we're trying to encourage programs to do and school districts to do is instead work together with this funding and where there's already a program in a community, how can the school and the program work together better? Is that sharing space? Is that sharing transportation? Is it even potentially sharing a mental health counselor that could, could bridge the day uh, part-time in the school and part-time in the after-school programs? So we are trying to encourage those partnerships around the state, um, and that's a project we're currently working on. We're also trying to um, take examples of where that's being done and then trying to highlight that and build some stories so that it is more um, seen as an opportunity going forward with both this funding and hopefully additional funding as, as we understand how important these programs are to our kids around the state. So I'll stop with that until we get back uh, around at the panel. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your perspective because I think what you just brought up is very important to these ESSER funds in that the funds are seen as being school district funds. And yet the reality is that some of those funds can be used by local organizations like 
um, small organizations that may have a very good handle on a cooking program and being able to teach during the summer cooking skills and those math skills that go along with cooking or having presentations to the public when you're doing um, teeny houses and that language acquisition that can come into that. So that platform of after school, uh, summer enrichment, the extended day, extended year is a platform that non-public school entities can participate in and then also partner with, as she was just mentioning, really partner with the school district to build that bridge. So when our current um, after school and summer enrichment programs, one of the things we ask organizations applying for on those grants are, have you touched bases with your local school district and have you looked at their plan for these funds so that there can be a braiding together of the funds? And that, that collaboration is really important. Um, Rachel has been wonderful in helping to push out the information about grants because I know how challenging it is to know that funding is out there, but then miss an opportunity. So she's been very helpful in pushing out and, and letting people know about when grants are available. So again, thank you so much for the work that you do on the field and, and helping to support the entities that do in fact use these funds for our students. Thank you so much. So our next speaker today, we're gonna move back into the public school arena and that is Heather Davis. Smith, who will be coming in from Zoom, but coming in from target range outside of Missoula. Thank you, Wendy. You got it right that time. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Heather Davis Schmidt here, superintendent at target range school district. Uh, also pleased to share what we have done. I think that um, we haven't done anything extraordinary. I've heard some fabulous ideas from all of you. So thank you so much for sharing those. Um, we use the tiny portion of our ESSER funds to do a collaborative um, development with our community, with our families. We, um, we are in Missoula, but we're on the outskirts of Missoula, and we're much more rural in nature than the rest of Missoula. And one of the things that we have access to is a really great trail system, but we don't have great community parks. And so... When we were looking at mental well-being and really getting our kids outside, we took the opportunity to uh, reach out to our families, reach out to our community, reach out to our staff, and even our students, and figure out what would be meaningful to them. And ultimately, we came up with the idea of um, an enhanced and new playground, essentially, for our second through fifth grade students that would really get them outdoors, uh, really get them playing, accessing the fresh air instead of being stuck inside. And also um, uh, we, we use our playground actually for a lot of our social emotional behavioral work that we do as well. We have a, a playground roundup a couple of times a year where we actually teach our students uh, safety skills for using the playground equipment, but also uh, strategies for interacting with each other. The design of our playground was very intentional based on feedback from our students. Uh, they wanted it accessible so that all of their colleagues, all of their peers could play on the playground equally with them. And they also uh, wanted lots of opportunity for imagination and play. So we uh, also are fortunate enough in Missoula to have the, um, I think it's called Creative Impulse. Um, I, I probably have the name of that wrong. Anyway, it's a program at the University of Montana that is an arts integration program that probably 50% of our teachers have participated in. And it's very much about getting active and, and integrating dance and uh, singing and music and um, painting and sculpture and all the different pieces of the arts into our teaching and classroom projects. So uh, that was a nice fit uh, with who we are as a community. and. Ultimately, I think what made this particularly special for us is we didn't use, uh, we didn't pay for the project with all ESSER funds. We actually uh, have a very collaborative relationship with our community. And uh, I came to uh, Target Range three years ago, right in the middle of COVID, July of 2020. And before we even knew ESSER money was going to be a thing, and we had a foundation in place, a Target Range School District Foundation, but it hadn't really been functional for several years. And so uh, I got the names of some mover and shaker parents and community members and brought them together virtually at the time. 
And uh, they have really taken off and created this fantastic, supportive environment that connects our community and our families to our school uh, for financial and volunteer support. And not only were we able to raise um, even more money towards our playground through this project, we were also uh, able to access other foundation grants, other community grants to help support the project. So uh, a very resourceful and collaborative project building. Like all of you, we have also used our ESSER money for academic improvements, um, implementing a brand new math curriculum, uh, spending some time identifying what that curriculum would look like, be like, and then spending a, a lot of investment money from ESSER to uh, prepare our teachers uh, to do that successfully. And, and we intend to do the same thing starting next year with literacy, because that was another area of high need for us that we demonstrated. But we also recognize we can only do so much new at any given time. So we're really laser focused on math right now, and we'll be moving into literacy next. And uh, I would say we were really laser focused on our outdoor learning and our social emotional learning um, during the first couple of years. So we just keep take, taking chunks at a time so that we can slowly get to the level of school improvement that we are all looking for and make it meaningful. So happy to answer any questions that anyone might have, but thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Superintendent, for joining us today and addressing that collaborative process. Because I think that when I came down and had met with your clerk and talked about the outdoor learning space. That was what really captivated me in terms of just the amount of work you have done in, in engaging everyone from the students to the teachers to the whole community. And that, of course, is part of the requirement of ESSER funding is that there is this meaningful stakeholder engagement that occurs along with the allocation of the funds and use of the funds. And you really demonstrated how impactful that can be, not just in the one project, but building those bridges and relationships beyond that in, in terms of your community. So really applaud that. And I like how you're strategically looking at the different areas. You know, we can't all focus on everything at once and just strategically looking at each of those um, is so important in each of our districts, but unique to our districts. So again, thank you so much for presenting today. Next up, we have from our uh, rural community, a superintendent who oversees several districts and that is Rhonda Long from Ferguson County. Hi, I am uh, in Fergus County. I oversee four K-8 independent elementary districts. Just to give you the size this year, my smallest has two, two students and my largest has 14 students. So truly the one room schoolhouse feel. Uh, for with us, we found out in 2020 that we were not prepared at all to go remote. And I don't know that anybody was, but in this, the little setting, absolutely not. So one of the first things we did is we had to figure out how to do remote. And our families are low economically. Uh, so we purchased hotspots so that anytime we had to go remote, that the hotspot along with the technology with laptops and stuff would go home with the students. And that helped. Then the next thing that kind of came up is as you're going through uh, cleaning heart and getting good, most two of my schools had carpet that was put in in the 90s. So as you're trying to get that nice and clean, uh, it started to fall apart. So we used semester funding to uh, get nice updated laminate flooring. And now anytime that we need to clean, especially if you have sickness like in December, it became evident as everybody was sick this year that that's we used it and were able to clean and know that we got uh, it actually sterilized in the classroom. Uh, and going forward, it's take a lot of work with the teachers, but what we're doing is looking at different programs that work both online with that component in case we ever do have to go remote again, but also looking at uh, what is gonna help our students. What have we, have they missed uh, in the last couple of years or not, not uh, gained as much as we would like. So it's, it's a lot of looking at the pieces and continuing to get that student growth. So we're just 
in the little schools, we're trying to figure out so that if, especially if this ever happens again or anything similar, we're ready to respond and, and to not have the learning loss that we saw before. Thank you. Thank you. And I know I can really appreciate that small classroom or small school. I went to school in Vermont in a two room that had four grades or three grades in it, I guess. And I don't think we had more than 10 students in the whole school. So the dynamics across Montana and the use of these funds is really different from the school room that has or schoolhouse that has two students to those that have 500 in the building or more. And the uniqueness of that it is really part of what makes Montana individual and being able to meet all the students needs so important. And the, I know I've spoken to some of your, your principals, teachers, clerks that wear all those multiple hats and how challenging it is then to have the compliances of a large grant like this. So we really appreciate the work that they're doing. Um, and our, our team, uh, and that's something I didn't mention up at the front is, that our team of ESSER support is really there all the time to be able to help the public when they have questions or when districts have questions, they literally can just pick up the phone and call and we can walk them through. And that's a term that we use quite a bit in the processing of these grants because there are changes that come about and we want districts and staff on the ground to know that we will literally walk them through the compliance pieces or help them fill out a form. Um, but that's something there and, and it's nice I know it's challenging when you're wearing multiple hats like your schools are, um, but I, I see that they've been impactful with the funds and, and using them to the best of the ability for their students because the students are all different. So thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate that. So just in, in conclusion today, um, we do have a significant amount of ESSER funds that are still being expended into this coming year, 23 and 24. ESSER 1 did expire this year and we did spend those funds very effectively. Um, on our website, we have a lot of information that the public can just go in and view. You can see we have a handout that was um, outside. You're welcome to get. But this is kind of a snapshot from the website itself. So it shows how much funding we received, how it went out to the districts. You can look at a district view if you wish. Um, and there's also a document that has compliances that are the guideline under which we review how funds are being used. Are there any questions? Yes. Sorry, would you mind for kind of repeating his questions just since we, we couldn't hear him online? So the question is around allowable use of ESSER funds and how funds in the past, certain types of funding for teacher salaries and retirement um, were pulled out of one account and can they be used for, can ESSER funding be used in that same capacity? Do I have that right. basically right? Okay, okay. Sorry, I know that was a summary. Um, so to answer that question, the way that funds are allocated to districts 
is based on a, a, a formula that's used based on Title I count. And so each district gets a certain amount of money. Then from that amount of money that's allocated to them, the school board at the local level actually gets to determine how those funds are used. Now, there is a certain percentage that's pulled out specific to learning loss. So there's a, a small portion that's pulled out for that. But the majority of the funds can be used based on what the district determines. So if the district says, we want to spend some funds on teacher bonuses, or we want to spend some funds on um, retirement components, they, they have the ability to do that. As individuals in the community, what these funds have been um, designed to do is to bring the community forward and have conversations about use of funds. So a requirement of spending the funds is meaningful stakeholder input. So we really, anybody in the public can go in front of a school board and say, we would like the funds spent this way and have that dialogue. That's where the use of funds though um, is directed. And, uh, we want to run for this part and say, okay, now it's one of the people not having borders. So we can change and they have a right to hold on to the So with that piece of legislative funding and how the legislators make those decisions, that I'm afraid I'm not familiar with. So that may have been, yeah, that I'm just not. Okay. Any other questions? You have one in the chat? Okay. Um, how well does lottery and property tax income cover the education income? And we see some of the reports income and So the question is related to how do lottery funds impact um, school budgeting and, and allocation of funds, if I have that correct from the chat. And I'm not familiar with that area of funding. So um, we can take a look at that and see if we can get you a response back. I'm not familiar with the legislative allocation on um, the lottery. We'll wait just a minute or two and see if there are any other questions that come. There's usually a lag time of about 15 seconds on the Zoom for questions, so feel free to put them in the chat if you're there. And again, while we're waiting to sort of uh, see on the chat, I do want to also introduce um, Rebecca Brown, who's feverishly sitting here taking notes, which I really appreciate. She is the ESSER manager. And um, many districts have had conversations with her about the transferability of funds and use of funds. She's been wonderful. She came on in, in July and has the background of being a teacher. So we really appreciate her being part of the team um, as we work with the ESSER funding. Any questions? Sure. Well, we do have one more question. Okay. Um, she's asking, uh, but what supports are in place to help districts transition transition from the use of funds to their end date in 2024? Very good question. So if districts have used funds for um, piloting programs uh, for say math and literacy, and then they, those programs are successful, the challenge is that when the funds expire, how do you continue those programs forward? And Rebecca and I both spend a significant amount of time working with districts on that type of planning. It's really a strategic plan to say, you develop a pilot and then how are you gonna fund it beyond that pilot stage, assuming that it's gonna be successful, maybe with some modifications. And sometimes that will be going out to the community and writing grants to continue those. Sometimes it's a matter of shifting funds Maybe there was allocation used in the past for a particular literacy program. Now you piloted using ESSER funds on a new literacy program. So the, the funding in 24 for the new literacy program comes from the old one and maybe abandoning it or combining those together. So that's definitely an area that both Rebecca and I tend to work with districts on. Um, the best way to do that is just to set up an individual Zoom meeting with us, or if you're local, we can 
come on site and, and talk about how to do that strategic planning. I also believe that um, some of the SAM and MASPO budget training talks about that strategic allocation of funds and bridging, they use the term bridging, um, and that can be another training source for that as well. Good question. Thank you, Wendy. We have one follow-up question from the lottery and property tax income question that we had earlier. Do you want me to repeat that question for you? Sure. Uh, so his original question was, how well does the lottery and property tax income cover the education expenses and can we see the financial reports, income and expense? And he's asking again, where uh, do we find the income and expense reports for the edu education de department? On, on the lottery and um, property tax. And I just, um, I remember that from my budgeting classes on and all these graphs that we had to do, but I don't know that off the top of my head. So I'll have to follow up with that. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, we've got one. Could ESSER two funds be used for school security? Yes. So ESSER funds are pretty flexible in the allowable use. So what that means is there's sort of a general checklist that we go through and say, you know, these are items that the Department of Education has indicated that we can use the funds for in general. The second area, which is more important to evaluate or equally important, is reasonableness. So if, and I use the, the easy one of technology, if you have two students, it is allowable to purchase laptops, but it is probably not reasonable to purchase 100 of them. And so in the security side, yes, you can purchase security equipment to make the, the building itself secure to help with the social emotional well-being of students and parents who bring their students to school. Um, and then what those are, what, what the equipment is that you purchase does need to follow uh, state and federal guidelines for bidding and, and reasonableness of use. But yes, it can be used for that. We tend to do those with districts under a project title. Um, and then again, we can help districts work through. So what kinds of things might you want in that capacity? Awesome. Uh, next, do you want me to just go for the next question? Yes, I think that popped, it popped up too quick. I can't read that fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, does grow your own programs such as teacher recruitment and, and retention, uh, are there, are, can they be funded by SR2 and SR3? Yes, they can. So again, um, there are lots of components of that grow your own. You might do professional development. You might do outreach uh, programs during the summer. Um, you know, if you're a school district that's located near a university, you might do a special event post, uh, a, you know, an event at the campus itself to promote um, recruitment. And um, you could have, even have tours of your school funded out of that. So there are lots of different ways that you can use um, ESSER funds for that. Recruitment and retention is a big labor shortage in general is not just with the teachers, but also bus drivers, CDL, um, a lot of those areas are ones that we have to be pretty innovative in order to get staffing, which is needed for the schools. We have a question here. Yes, um, can special funds be used for dual credit for mm. uh, education or for uh, for uh, So I love that question. That is a question about can ESSER funds be used for dual enrollment. And dual enrollment is one of my, you know, really, really strong advocacies for students these days. Um, and yes, it can. So actually the new um, guidelines that just came out by the Department of Education, December 7th, has a whole section in section C that actually identifies how ESSER funds can be used for not only the students who are bridging, which is what dual enrollment is doing, bridging them into the next phase, whether it's college or career. So career technical or straight college, um, but also those students who may have completed or dropped out and are just not doing anything out there. So many times our small communities know who those individuals are. And so funds can still be used for that group to help re-engage. Yes. Can 
So there are a couple of ways on that. Um, one way is to go through the local school board. And, and again, the schools were allocated a certain amount of funding and those fundings can then be allocated based on how the school district, the school board decides they wanna use the funding. So school board decides they wanna use it for a literacy K-8 program, as opposed to dual enrollment that's within their guidelines. The other way it can be used is that you can have outside organizations like After School Alliance, their organizations that work with them to develop a program that enhances that college and career platform and they can apply for funding separately and they can use those um, for dual enrollment in that type of pathway. And those, there's a grant open right now on that. Yes. <laughs> The adult ed on the frequently asked question, and it's a new guideline, they sort of enhance it, um, is vague. I, I think the definition of adult would be part of it, like how that age span ends up hitting. Dual enrollment caps out at 19. And so at what point is, 18, is the adult education kicking in or not? And there's some, there's some guidelines that they can't overlap. Um, but there is funding that can be applied in those platforms. Um, there's also homeless ESSER funds that are, again, kind of outside of the school district. Okay, yeah, that are outside of that area. So um, really what your question brings up is, are all the ESSER funds allocated to schools? And the answer to that is no. There are these peripheral entities that are much smaller amounts, but they are available. And we are trying to bridge those to, to work with the school districts and the same, the funding so that it works together. Yes. So, a lot of the components, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of students, for example, virtual reading are left in the communities mm -hmm. by the parents to just continue on in school okay. with very few resources. Can for dyslexic children, for example, or um, okay. So those Wendy, would you mind repeating that question for us? So again, this is the peripheral funding of, of ESSER. So students who are um, left in districts to sort of uh, manage their own education, um, they're on their own. Um, they may be, they're tied in with a school, but they're pretty much at home is what, is what they're kind of doing. Um, how can ESSER funds or um, other educational funds help to support them? And one, I would say that there are a tremendous amount of resources that are available on the OPI website. So, and that's why I kind of mentioned the dyslexic area that there's a, we have a wonderful website that has a lot of resources. MSU Bozeman also has a tremendous amount on that. Um, there are different, each school district handles those students very differently. Um, there are some outward bound programs that tag into those kids. They're sort of unofficially, students tend to refer to themselves as we're couch surfing um, kind of mode and, and it can be a variety of different things. So school districts handle them differently. Often the homeless coordinator is the one who will pick them up and resources again are available through that homeless coordinator at the school district. But then also at OPI, we also have those um, coordinators too so they can work together. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to answer just a couple more questions that are online. We're, we're at time, but um, I'll try and answer those. Thank you. So from Kyla Rispins with the Missoulian uh, newspaper is asking, how many ESSER funds are remaining in Montana to be spent before September of 24? Um, we have, I will ask Rebecca to bring that up because I don't know that right off the top of my head. On our OPI website, on the first uh, when you choose ESSER on the right-hand side, you'll see a big thermostat that has all the different buckets of funding on it. And so ESSER 1 has already been spent, and that was roughly about $41 million. And then we have ESSER 2, which is in the middle, and that has, I think, $170 million and three, three 382-ish million. So each of those has a thermostat, and that's updated on a monthly basis. 
and you can find the actual amount on the bottom. It shows you the amount, but also a thermostat view on it. Uh, Skylar, I did include the link to the ESSER page uh, in the chat as well. For yes. You. Thank you, Tristan, for putting that yeah. on it. And then a question from Don Matt with the uh, Smith Valley K-8. Um, we hired staff to address learning recovery. When the money is gone, the need for learning recovery will still be there. What possibility exists to retain this staff in our case, Title I and 504 staff? You mean, can you trans, I guess is the question, can you transition staff who are paid out of ESSER, transition them into title funding? positions they're okay. wondering what the steps will be from moving uh having them under esser money to continuing to have them after the esser money is gone if you want to move a staff member from esser funded position to a title funded position as long as you have funds in the title funding then you should be able to move them directly over um, there are going to be some exceptions to that but in general Title funding follows very much the same guidelines as ESSER. So the allowable use would be the same. If you're asking instead, we don't have any extra title funding. We have these individuals who are performing a very legitimate role um, and we need them to continue, their funding needs to continue. I think that's, again, working individually with you, we could set up a time to address particular areas of funding source for your district. So. Um, Paulson, you're you're within the range of several different foundations who are willing to continue some of the support. It is a grant process. Um, some of it could be continued even under the 21st century granting that's coming up. So there are several different areas that you could use. Uh, Don says thank you. I'll be in touch with you. Okay, thanks. That was all of our questions. Okay. Thank you so much for attending. And if there are any additional questions afterwards, feel free to reach out either via phone or via email to either Rebecca or I. Thank you so much.